challenges. And I'm really excited for this panel, and we actually have with us here in the theater Admiral Titley, who has even a better job now. He's a, a volunteer um, up at the campgrounds in the National Park, so we're really excited to have him with us here in the studio. But the moderator for this session <clears throat> is going to be Aaron Sikorsky. Aaron is the Deputy Director for the, of the Center for Climate and Security, again, our event partner, and the Director of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Previously, she served as the Deputy Director of the Strategic Futures Group on the National Intelligence Council in the U.S., where she co-authored the Quadrennial Global Trends Report and led the U.S. Intelligence's Community Environmental and Climate Security Analysis. She is also the founding chair of the Climate Security Advisory Council, a congressionally mandated group designed to facilitate coordination between the intelligence community and the U.S. government's scientific agencies. Mr. Sikorsky worked in the U.S. intelligence community for over a decade. So, Aaron, over to you and the panel. Today, and I just caught the last of that other panel and really enjoyed hearing what they had to say. Uh, you know, we at the Center for Climate and Security are very pleased to partner with the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs and Prime Movers Lab on this conference. And I'm really excited to moderate this panel, which is a very timely discussion, right? As folks were just referencing in the past panel, every day there's a new article in the news about the unprecedented severity of the Western drought and what that means uh, for Wyoming and for other countries in the West, not only in terms of water security, but also agriculture issues, uh, fire risk, and all of those mix of, of local issues. But as the panel is going to discuss today, it's not only the direct impacts, right, of drought and wildfire risk that can pose security risks to the state, but also developments further afield that then connect here at home. So when we talk climate security risks, we often refer to them as, quote, borderless risks. And as we saw with the pandemic, this past year, what happens in one far off part of the world can very easily have reverberations elsewhere. So we have three excellent panelists to discuss different aspects of the risk today. I'm going to begin by introducing all of them and then turning to each for some framing remarks before opening to a broader conversation. We'll also have time for questions from the audience, so please use the, the chat feature in Vimeo to post your questions as we go, and I'll keep an eye on that and field them for our panelists as well. So our first panelist is gonna set the stage for us today is Admiral David Titley. He's actually coming to you live from Jackson, as Nathan mentioned, and is the founder of RV Weather, which provides weather and routing services to the recreational vehicle community. After graduating from Penn State, Admiral Titley served as a Naval officer for 32 years and rose to the rank of Rear Admiral. Dr. Titley's career included duties as navigator, meteorologist, and oceanographer on five ships, and ultimately as oceanographer and navigator of the Navy. In 2009, Dr. Titley initiated and led the U.S. Navy's Task Force on Climate Change. He's also served as the Chief Operating Officer at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. After this amazing career, he spent 2013 to 2019 as a professor of practice in meteorology at Penn State, and he founded the university's Center for Solutions to Weather and Climate Risk. And then in 2020, he started a new career, something that I think we all are perhaps a little jealous of, volunteering for the National Park Service in Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming. After Admiral Titley, we'll move to our second panelist, Ambassador Richard Hallwell, who has more than 30 years of experience as a foreign policy professional. He served in a number of policy level positions in the U.S. Department of State, including as U.S. Ambassador to Ecuador. He was on the team that negotiated the Strategic Arms Control Agreement, START II, with the Soviet Union and a multilateral treaty banning chemical weapons. Since leaving government, he has supported the international operations of major U.S. companies and is credited with resolving commercial disputes in China, India, and several other countries. Finally, our third panelist today is Commissioner Mark Newcomb, who is a native Wyoming, Wyomingian, I'm not sure how to, what the right word is there. Uh, he grew up in Wilson, Wyoming. He earned a BA in geology from Carleton College in 1990. He studied Mandarin Chinese at Beijing Teachers College and Nanjing University in 19, 1988 along the way. In 1990, he traveled for a year in China, funded by a Watson Fellowship 
visiting farmers to learn about Chinese agricultural practices. He's also worked as a mountain guide for 18 years, returning to China many times to lead trips and climbs in the country. In 2010, he earned an MS in economics from the University of Wyoming with a focus on carbon capture, storage, and utilization and enhanced oil recovery. And from 2012 through 2014, he worked at the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs, re researching carbon offsets and assisting in a grant writing role. 2014, he also co-authored a paper on the ecological and economic impacts of climate change on the greater Yellowstone ecosystem for the Jackson-based Chartour Institute. And he's currently in his sixth year serving on Teton County's Board of County Commissioners. So as you can see, we've got a range of experience here uh, all over the world, but also locally within Wyoming. And so we're going to have a great discussion today. I'd like to turn first to Admiral Titley. Admiral, the previous panel provided a global perspective on the security risks of climate change. But as we know, the climate change has security impacts right where you stand today in Wyoming. So how, can you help us make that connection? Walk us through an overview as to why people in Wyoming and the West should care about these security risks of climate change. Okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Aaron. Really appreciate the introduction and appreciate being on this, uh, on this panel. Uh, one of the things I kind of like to start these uh, kind of sessions with is, is what, in my view, climate change is not about. It's not about a Keeling curve. It's not about a hockey stick. It's not about computer models. With apologies to all my science friends, and yes, I was one of them, so I can say that. What it is about is people, it's about water, and it's about change. Uh, we have had stability in the climate system for roughly eight to maybe 10,000 years. And that's not incoincidentally when agriculture started and really we came out of the Stone Age, if you will, of hunter-gatherer and, and started the trajectory that you know, ends up with everybody having one of these things in their pocket. Uh, but that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about how does climate impact us and that's all the way from the national level to the regional level out west all the way down to a state level in Jackson and the, and, and the different communities in, here in Wyoming. I mentioned water because water is one of the ultimate integrating principles of climate. And, and you know, when people think water, they're thinking sea level rise, they're thinking Florida, they're thinking Norfolk, Virginia, as Admiral Phillips very eloquently uh, discussed in the, in the previous panel. I would argue the water issues out here in the West are every bit as significant as what the East Coast and West is gonna face in Gulf with, uh, with, with the sea level rise. Uh, there was a report that just was released actually yesterday called the Greater Yellowstone Assessment, a uh, Greater Yellowstone Area, excuse me, Climate Assessment Report. And it talks about how although like right here in Grand Teton and, and Jackson, the average precipitation isn't changing a whole lot. If anything, it's going up a little bit. But the timing and the type are changing tremendously. So what's happening is we're getting wetter springs, but that's becoming rain and not snow. And we're seeing a great decrease in the summer precipitation along with a very strong warming or even hot uh, trend. And you know, if you wanted to uh, create the conditions for wildfires, this is what you do. Uh, so, and I think we're gonna hear a lot more about the fire issues from, from Commissioner Newcomb. So back to security, because that's what we're supposed to be talking about here. Uh, well, how is it, how does all this relate to Wyoming? You know, why does the operating environment or readiness of our nation's military, infrastructure changes, geopolitical uh, instability and accelerants, which we've heard some about previously, impact us? Well, one, it's people. And it turns out that the Montana, Idaho, and uh, Wyoming uh, region has probably 10 to 50% per capita greater enlistment rates and higher veterans rates than we see in many other parts of the country re relative to the nation as a whole. Uh, we look at the economic security from changing in tourism, changing how uh, places, let's say, driven by Yellowstone, driven by Grand Teton, driven by the National Forest, are gonna change. We look at the physical security. Again, wildfires, uh, you know, if you've ever had to evacuate from a fire, that is a very visceral reaction, and, and I would say it doesn't get much more physical security than that. 
We're going to look at migration, and Ambassador Hallwell is going to talk about that. But this is not only external migration, but internal migration. You know, how long do you think people in New Mexico and Arizona and Southern California are going to put up with day after day of 120 degrees? Because that's what they have right now with little water. Uh, they're going to go someplace just like people in disadvantaged countries are going to get out of those regions. And where are they coming? They're going to come north because that's where it's cooler. Uh, so you put all of this together, and what you see is that we have this people, water, and the change. And the change is the part of the climate, honestly, that scares me more than anything else. We're pretty resilient species. We can pretty well figure out how to deal with something. But as long as it's within a stable band, I mean, that's kind of how we built civilization. Uh, we are changing, and it is we, we are changing the climate faster than we have ever seen it on Earth. Uh, so that means that these changes are happening at, at a speed which is exceptionally difficult for the natural ecosystem and, frankly, for humans to adapt to. Uh, these changes are getting baked in right now, pardon the pun, and it is something that really regardless of the near and midterm policy actions that are going to happen, ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren at a minimum are going to have to deal with these changes. And we can either be proactive or we can be reactive, and that is our choice. And I strongly recommend that we try to get ahead of this power curve because otherwise, uh, you know, putting our head in the sand is not going to make it go away. We are going to have to deal with this, and that is every single person in the United States, and including and especially in the northern Rocky region where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Admiral Titley, and I think you've done a great job of highlighting what I like to think of as the mismatch between our current systems and way of doing business, and whether it's the physical infrastructure or our societal resilience mechanisms and what's what's coming because of the changes and that they're happening so quickly. So I think that's a key theme uh, to take away in this in this discussion today. And hopefully we can explore that more in the question and answer period. But I'd like to move now uh, to Ambassador Hallwell. You've worked and lived in Central America, a region of the world experiencing serious climate hazards that are destroying people's livelihoods and driving them from their homes. And to that end, there was a World Bank study a few years ago that looked at different areas of the world, the Sahel, South Asia, Central America, and examined what the study called premeditated responses to slow onset shifts in the environment, which is a bit of a mouthful. But I'd like you to help us understand what that phrase means and why understanding it is so important to folks, not only in those places of the world, but in the Western United States and in Wyoming. So over to you, sir, to... Thank you, Aaron. That, uh, I appreciate that. I certainly appreciate the remarks of prior speakers. I will repeat some of the things they said, but I hope to provide a little more uh, context and a possibly a, a slightly different perspective on some of these topics by looking long term as the uh, World Bank study did. One of the things I liked best about that World Bank study was it created perspective on the size, scope, the importance of this problem. It noted that for most of humankind's existence, we lived in a zone where production was possible, which facilitated agriculture and, and didn't, uh, didn't facilitate diseases. So think about the Earth's surface, as the World Bank did. It noted that at present, Roughly 1% of the land area of this earth is uninhabitable. Think the Sahara. Were there significant increases in median annual temperatures, Sahara-like hot zones could cover nearly a fifth of the earth's land area. And it means that one out of every three individuals, we're talking hundreds of millions of people, would be forced to move. The World Bank study excluded the temporary movements of people due to natu natural disasters and things such as that. They also ignored second order factors such as the depletion of groundwater. Rather, they focused on what Aaron just said, this mouthful, the premeditated response 
to slow onset shifts in the environment. Now, we're going to deal with that, but I, I, I want to make sure that you understand where it would be wrong to assume that climate-driven migration will only take place at some nebulous future date. The simple fact is people are already migrating as a consequence of environmental degradation. According to the World Bank, more than 8 million people have already moved from Central America. Sorry, talking about my home, <laughs> an area I know well. From Central, Amer Central Africa, primarily toward Europe. Indeed, it is the Sahel in North Africa. This is, Sahel is an, African, is an Arabic word that means beach. And it is the beach from the great sand sea of the Sahara. So the Sahel faces the most severe crisis today. The nine countries stretching across the continent from Mauritania to Sudan are suffering significant population growth, as well as a steep decline in the environment that, in which they live. Those two things are on a collision course. Go back a few years, and since 1990, Droughts in this area have killed more than 100,000 people. And today, more than 150 million people are threatened by desertification, water shortages, and deforestation. The story is similar in South Asia, particularly India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Monsoons have been weaker. I was in India when people were waiting for the monsoon. It was late and it was weak and that spells disaster for these countries. The World Bank projects that the region will soon have the highest incident of food insecurity in the world. And it notes that 8.5 million people have already fled, fled, many to the upper valleys of the Indus and Ganges rivers. The bank study projected the displacement of 17 to 36 million people in South Asia over the next three decades. Central America has experienced 20 years of declining rainfall and for the past 15, a full-scale drought. A research team at the University of Texas estimated that between 2014 and 2020, 1.5 million climate refugees left Central America, primarily from Guatemala and Honduras, and primarily headed toward the United States. The World Bank report says to expect 60% decrease in rainfall in Central America through the decade. The study contends that heated air from, that it, the, from the ground has driven away seasonal rains and facilitated the spread of beetles that have red, ravaged the pine forest. The loss of the pine forest in turn led to a water retention problem, thereby creating a self-perpetuating cycle of heat drought and despair. The World Bank study concluded that the changing climate will force a vast remapping of the world's population with hundreds of millions of people forced to move away from these uninhabitable zones. That's over the next three decades. A movement of this magnitude will have security and political implications. I heard Marine General Anthony Zinni speak about the um, rebellion in Syria and he noted that it was instigated by the government's bad handling of a prolonged drought. So clearly, climate change can cause civil unrest that in some cases spill over to cross-border wars. One of the earlier speakers mentioned the fact that China tries to control the headwaters. That, ha that happens in South America and a couple of places as well. It is easy to imagine a cross-border war breaking out because the headwaters to a river have been cut off. You know, it, it, we have to recognize, too, that immigration influences politics. It was certainly a factor in the 2016 election in the United States. It was a major factor with Brexit in the UK and has influenced politics in Hungary, Germany, and several other European countries. And it's a big issue in India. An earlier... Um, earlier speaker noted the wall, the, the fence they built along the border with Bangladesh. That's a 2,500-mile border. And the Indian fear is that the Bangladeshis will seek to move to India when they are flooded out.
But again, uh, as the Admiral mentioned, climate migration is not just a problem in the, in the tropics. We are seeing an internal migration here in the United States as a con consequence of rising sea levels. Some low-lying low parts of my home state, Louisiana, have been evacuated. The most recent has been a community on the on Ile de Chasse, the Jean Charles. In addition, communities in Alaska and Washington state have also been evacuated and moved to higher ground. And I recently had a conversation with a friend of mine who lives in Asheville, North Carolina. She was complaining bitterly about Floridians who were moving to that mountain community to escape hurricanes. And I think some of you in Jackson Hole might share her frustration over a surge in population, be it from climate or the coronavirus. But the point is, as has been said before, we must prepare for migration from hot zones and coastal areas. Our first instinct may be to build fences and close our doors, but we must not close our minds to the problem. It is axiomatic that if you know something bad is coming, it is a problem, not a crisis. We can see that environmental migration is inevitable. And if we do not start now to develop policies to deal with it, the mi migration problem will become a full-scale crisis. At that point, we're going to be forced to decide if we really want to tackle the problem head on or just ignore it. And like people in a lifeboat, use our oars to beat back those who are trying to climb in. As has been said, becoming knowledgeable about this topic is critical. And all of us, I think, have an obligation to explain to the people who are uh, doubting global warming how real it is and how it is certain to affect their lives in coming years. Aaron, thank you very much. I look forward to whatever questions may come up. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. And thank you for pushing us again, as Admiral Titley did, to think about these future risks and the fact that we actually, uh, the benefit is we have models and we have information that we know what's coming to a certain extent so we can prepare. And that's a key, uh, Key, a key thing we must must keep in mind. But I want to talk now with Commissioner uh, Newcomb about the the risks that are already here. Right? It isn't it, there. There are problems in the future, but there are also problems happening today. And as we've we've already referenced multiple times, the the record setting drought that we're facing in the Western United States that's demonstrating today uh, that that the risks are here. So I want to ask the commissioner, what are you most worried about this summer regarding the drought and the risks of wildfire? And of course, then if you want to project out further as well, please, please do so. But I think we can talk about today, um, for a little bit. Okay. Thank you. First, I really want to, um, thank all of you for being persistent and, and patient and waiting for Nathan to finally pull this thing together. And great job, Nathan. You're, uh, he's really doing a terrific job carrying the torch that, um, that uh, his father, David, went um, uh, lit some years ago. And I think this is a really important event. I'm glad that we're pulling it off. Um, um, <coughs> welcome, uh, Admiral Titley. Uh, I appreciate that you're here. Um, I'm going to uh, speak directly to the question, but I'm going to deviate from script as well and um, and speak about uh, climate change from another entirely separate angle, but one that we cannot ignore. So let me first dive into what you talked about and ask about with uh, wildfire. Um, and of course, on Zoom, you know, things are a little bit herky jerky. So just let me know if you lost, if I drop out at all. But um, uh, basically, in 1988, um, I climbed the Grand Teton before I left for China. I left for China on about July 1st, but I climbed the Grand, and it felt like I was climbing it in uh, late July, based on the amount of snow that we had had um, up, up there on the peaks. The weather was very similar to what the weather has been this year. And eventually, 1988 turned into the worst fire year that Yellowstone had seen in and certainly modern history and in anyone's memory, uh, it ended up burning 
there were 250 separate fires. Uh, they burned, let me pull up the stats here. Um, let's see, I had them, my cheat sheet. Hold on a quick sec. I, I'd like to share these stats. Um, okay, so the fires burned. We had 250 fires and they burned uh, about 13,000 square kilometers and it cost a uh, half million dollars. Um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, $500 million to, to put them out. Um, the, uh, just recently we had a much smaller fire. The cost of fires are going up. We had a much smaller fire about five years ago. Uh, it was uh, 14 square kilometers and that fire cost $9 million to put it out. So the cost of putting out these fires is going up uh, dramatically. Um, uh, the predictions are that by 2050, we will see the same scale of fires. Uh, those fires burned about 3,213 square kilometers. We'll see those same scale of fires across um, Yellowstone much more frequently. And uh, they could occur five times if the predictions, if we continue on the current course with our climate um impacts and with the climate change as it's as it's progressing right now we could see five more seasons before 2050 of similar scale fire hazard and what happens for us here is that uh, we have economic impacts and um we there was a drop in visitation by 500,000 visitors in 1988 uh, we lost uh, we lost revenues of, on the order of $21 million in tourist expenditures. And um, ironically, because of federal payments, it's the federal government that shares the major portion of the costs for fires of that scale. Um, federal payments to take care of the fires and put the fires out return $10.8 million to the economy. But of course, those dollars come in very different forms through different channels than what the economy is structured for. Um, so wildfire is, is, a, is a big risk, direct risk economically for us. Um, I think indirectly though, there are significant health impacts when the air quality is poor the uh, the folks, um, if they go outside very much or spend time outside hiking, exercising, doing all the things that uh, people come here to to recreate for, uh, suffer. Um, the immediate impacts, of course, of the um, you know watering eyes or burning lungs, but much longer term, higher levels of mercury. I think that's been documented in throughout the West. Uh, folks in who who live in areas more prone to wildfires have higher levels of mercury from the, the wildfire smoke, um, you know, and just longer term impacts in terms of uh, um, that might not be in, expected. For example, last, uh, a, a few years ago when we had an August that was very hazy and smoky, a lot of folks who were planning weddings here canceled their weddings and uh, and shifted them either to another time of year or to another place. And that's a pretty significant impact for uh, a, a large slice of the small business community. Um, so all those are direct and kind of um, immediate impacts that, that we worry about here, um, taking a lot of local resources and a lot of federal resources. And as long as you're, you know, those resources have to come from somewhere. Now, on the other hand, I want to flip the tables quite a bit. So I think 
Well, I'll just finish up by summarizing by saying, you know, Teton County, we, we kind of feel like an island to some extent. We don't feel like we have much control over our future. We're, we're one of those islands out in the ocean that as sea level rises and the rest of the world continues to emit carbon, um, we, are, we are watching our life, our livelihoods potentially get threatened here. But I want to talk about livelihoods in another sense as well. And that um, for that, uh, I'll focus on the um, neighboring county to the south, Sublette County. Sublette County has about the same population as Teton County. It's 5,000 square miles in size. And um, it is highly, it has a lot of federal land, a lot of BLM, a lot of Forest Service land, and it's very dependent on natural gas in particular, but the fossil fuel industry um, the top 10 taxpayers in Sublette County are Ultra Resources, Jonah Energy, Pinedale Energy Partners, Exxon Mobil Corp, Vanguard Operating, Jonah Gas Gathering, Wexpro Company, EOG Resources, Exxon Mobil, Exaro Energy. And they together possess uh, about $1.9 billion in the overall assessed value of the county. Um, about 90% of the county's revenue comes from the mineral industry. Uh, and a lot of the jobs. And essentially, I think uh, the, the, if the commissioners were here and could speak to what they see in uh, this discussion is a potential threat to their way of life. And uh, it creates a lot of angst, a lot of fear. And a lot of concern when we are talking at a high level about how we need to take really aggressive action on climate. Now, they're not ignorant of the issue, and they've stashed away $150 million in a depreciation reserve account for their county, and they've allocated that to address the essential needs to take care of the health and welfare of their citizens. Um, but any, any talk of a transition to a whole different energy future and a low carbon future really cannot ignore counties like Sublette County across the nation, whether they're in Pennsylvania, whether they're in New Mexico, whether they're in uh, Wyoming. And I, I think that um, I in the past have, before I became a county commissioner, not recognized the existential threat that we face on two fronts. One is the existential threat that has been talked about here in terms of climate change and its impacts on the nation and the nation's security. But of course, counties across the US face an existential threat if we transition in a way that doesn't recognize what that threat is to those communities. So I wanted to throw that out there. It's a little off script, but I think it's something critical to put on the table as we continue talking about the view from the county level about climate change and uh, what we're gonna do about it, but at the same time, how we're gonna move forward on real solutions and recognize the challenges ahead. So thank you. And with that, I'll let us continue the, the session. Great, thank you so much, uh, Mark. Those were excellent, excellent comments and remarks and really appreciate that very zoomed in local, local view of, of the issue, which I think is so, so important because even though this is a global phenomenon and a cross-border phenomenon, it plays out differently in different parts of the world and having that local knowledge is key to uh, building solutions, which is the qu first question I wanna ask all three of you. I mean, it came up in each of your remarks a bit is this ability as, as Admiral Titley said to be proactive as opposed to reactive in, in regard to these risks. And so my question to you is, what are the one or two things you would really like to see uh, happen proactively to address some of the risks that you all discussed? Um, whether it is action by local governments or state governments uh, more broadly among civil society, just to get, get some of your perspectives on that. And maybe um, uh, Admiral Titley, if we can start with you and we'll, we'll go through 
the the group here again, but but what are those proactive uh, things you'd like to see? And to the audience, I'll just remind you to please put your questions into the the chat and Vimeo, um, so we can turn to you as well for those questions. But Admiral Titley. Okay. Well, thanks thanks, Aaron. Uh, appreciate appreciate the the question there. Uh, I've often been asked giving, I guess, public talks for more than a decade on this subject now, you know, what can I do or what should we do or variants of that. And uh, if this was my normal thing and I had a PowerPoint slide, I would show you a picture of a llama, which somebody came up to me afterwards and said I was using an alpaca, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but I use a llama because the way I spell llama is L-L-M-A. I know it's maybe not quite right, but the first L is learn. Uh, and, and actually, Admiral Herring in the previous panel talked about this. So, you know, it is actually pretty difficult to get a society at whatever level, be it local, regional, state, national, international, moving on an issue if we, if we don't, you know, have a common baseline, a, a common understanding. Uh, I would recommend uh, the National Academy of Sciences Climate Change Evidence and Causes. It was just updated within the past year. It was one of our pandemic projects. Uh, and it will really give, as a citizen, everything you need to know is to be an informed citizen. It will not make you Michael Mann. It will not get you a Nobel Prize in climate science. It will give you enough information to be an informed citizen. So climate change, uh, evidence and causes, it's by the National Academy. My second part is local action. I mean, and, and uh, you know, Commissioner Newcomb kind of talked about some of this. You know, I would, I would say if, if you can have a, a, you know, a common baseline that, yeah, this is going to be an issue, you know, so what are the biggest threats for here? I would argue, and, and the commissioner may disagree with me, but I would argue that fire and water are probably two of our biggest threats and how we manage those. Uh, so whether that's building codes, uh, whether that's simply enforcement of perhaps already existing ordinances on the books, whether that's being proactive about how we manage our water, because you know this is an area of one to 200 inches of snow a year, traditionally. So you kind of think, well, water's not an issue up here in the Northern Rockies. Well, it's going to be, especially during the summer. And uh, you know it's going to be an issue of too much water in the springtime, because between excess rainfall, which is now falling as rain, and an enhanced and aggressive snow melt, how do we manage that? Are we, you know, are we going to, in fact, start looking a little bit more like some other states, like California, where you have a very pronounced wet season and a dry season? You know, that's a, that's a big change compared to where we are here. Uh, monitoring, the, the Greater Yellowstone uh, Area Climate Assessment Model, if you read their, their recommendations, virtually everyone starts with monitoring. That's monitoring ecosystem services. It's monitoring and understanding better the water. It's monitoring the fish and wildlife, which generates so much tourism up here as one of the persons who works on the side of the road. I can tell you, we get thousands of people to show up as soon as a grizzly bear makes its appearance. Uh, but all those people stay someplace and they generate meals and hotels and, and, and all of that. And it's very good for, for the local economy. So we need to monitor this. And then finally, I would say the advocacy. We need to have advocacy all the way from local officials like the commissioner, all the way through our state and frankly, our federal officials to take the actions. And I would say the, the A, not only it's advocacy, but we have to both do adaption and the mitigation. And it's an and, it's not an or. And sometimes when we get uh, democratic administrations, we tend to focus more on mitigation. Sometimes in other administrations, we'll do sort of a minimal adaptation, but say, well, well, we don't really need to change, fundamentally change. And I would argue we need to do both. Uh, and and that would be that would be my my desire for what to do. So piece of cake, right? <laughs> yeah, excellent. All right. Uh, uh, Ambassador Hallwell, how about you? What are your thoughts about what we can do to be proactive? We must remain engaged with the world. In uh, 2018, the international community forged a treaty on, on migration. The U.S. chose not to sign it. 
Now, I haven't read it carefully. I don't know everything it says, but I do want to look at it. And if it is a sound treaty, I want to advocate the U.S. government sign and participate more actively in the with the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, you mentioned my time in Central America, and I have to say I have a great affection for those countries. And I would very much like to see the U.S. government change its attitude, um, particularly toward Honduras. The, uh, the problem in the minds of many is just the fact that as the economy collapsed, drug dealers moved in and are using Honduras as a base for transshipment of cocaine to the United States. That's a mistake. We need to do both. We need to fight the drug trafficking in that region because it creates political instability. But we need to find ways to work with people to establish better water resource management programs and do the other things needed to keep the desertification from becoming too widespread. And in Guatemala, they have a serious problem with coffee. The coffee crop has been destroyed because temperatures, as they rise up the mountain, permit uh, a fungus called coffee rust to go up with it. The farmers can't afford the fungicide to kill the coffee rust. And I think we would be well advised to try to support them in that regard. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, Mark, Commissioner Newcomb, how about yeah, thank your you. perspective? Thank you. Um, Admiral Tilly, you're correct. I do agree with you. Wildfire and water are major concerns. So I'll try and give a little specific perspective uh, on what we're doing. We have a mapped wild urban wildland urban interface, which is the interface between wildlands where wildfires could start and the urban more built lands of the uh, unincorporated county. And uh, we do have specific zoning regulations for construction in that area. It's, in my opinion, it's it's too late. You know, uh, a lot of that development occurred before we started zoning at all in 1978. Even more occurred between 1978 and more stringent zoning regulations in 1994. And since 1994, we've progressively gotten a little more strict. Finally, just this year, we passed... Uh, a regulation that um, required all roofing to be non-combustible material, no more cedar shakes. It had to be actually, um, you know, some sort of artificial non-combustible material. And we hired a new position this year, which is a specific, in our fire EMS department, a specific wildland urban interface sort of patrol officer that will be roving the county uh, helping with education, evaluating structures, and helping uh, determine strategy for defending those structures when we do have a wildfire uh, risk. Um, we are, are making strides on addressing water and water quality. Um, there's, again, we are, we are an island here. You know, we cannot do that much other than come up with adaptations and defensive measures in the face of whatever changing climate is going to come our way. Uh, if I were uh, king for a day and certainly ran the globe, I, I as with an economics background, would, would um, think about carefully a, a carbon tax. Um, you know, if we, I think a, a $10 per ton carbon tax adds about nine cents a gallon to every gallon of gas. And if every uh, the, the vast majority of carbon emissions from Teton County are from the transportation sector and all the visitors who drive in here. And if they were, uh, you know, paying 36 or 45 cents more a gallon of gas, they might be more aware of how far they're driving, what, what they're driving, and, and in, in a small way, um, decrease the emissions coming from our main industry, tourism, uh, that rely on them driving here. Uh, with their rigs, but um, that's pretty much all we can do is, is try and adapt through uh, well thought out ordinances. And uh, I can tell you, we got a lot of pushback just on the roofing ordinance alone. Uh, technically it's not an ordinance, it's a, it's a development regulation. The town passes the ordinances, but um, 
you know, the, the building industry was, was right in there uh, pushing back on it. And that's just the kind of change at the granular level that, uh, you, you know, the kind of forces that oppose change at the granular level that we have to think about broadly as we move forward with um, policies and, and um, specific means to address our impacts on the climate. So I, I'll leave it at that for now and we can move on to the next question. Great, thank you, Mark. And you know, you raised something that I wanted to delve deeper into a little bit is this question of when there are divides within communities, right? You said you got some pushback on, on the regulations and as governments struggle to meet competing demands, for example, amongst different constituencies, uh, something that's come up in, in many of your remarks is water stress. And you've seen what I think are a little bit some hysterical headlines in the West about water wars, quote unquote, um, as the drought continues. But I do think this question of rising tensions amongst communities that have different competing claims to water, uh, that sort of thing, and, and the concern is around potential political instability or just rising tensions within communities. And so if maybe one or, or more of you could talk a little bit about how you think about how these issues are not only affecting kind of hard infrastructure, but also societal um, cohesion and stress in local communities as uh, these climate change uh, impacts become more intense and how we might think about that. Does anyone want to tackle, yeah. tackle so that Aaron, part of the question? Yeah, Aaron, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take a, a shot at that. And, and it may not get exactly there, but just from seeing what's going on, and this is going to be very local. So this is my experience in Grand Teton National Park, working as a volunteer, working very closely with a number of rangers. And, and I don't think it's giving away any state secrets to say that we are seeing either record or near record visitation now, really since the park reopened post pandemic. Uh, campgrounds that never filled now fill every day and they're filled right until the end of the season. Uh, when we work the roads in these grizzly bear jams and other wildlife jams, we are seeing, and we're seeing this also at the very busy lakes here, the tensions rising. Uh, and part of that is heat. Uh, but part of that is competition. So this may not be competition for water per se, but I think when you, you, know, you, you see at this very granular individual you know, kind of level, you know, competition of I'm not gonna get to see that animal or I'm not gonna get a parking space or you know, I paid my $35 entrance fee, why won't the park let me do fill in the blank? Uh, even though, you know, just as, as Mark mentioned, you know, for the greater good, so that you're, we're not only trying to save you, but we're trying to save the community, you know, you need to change ways you're building, but there's a lot of pushback, and we're seeing that. And I think this is one of the, you know, we're not going to figure this out in the next nine minutes here on this panel, although I wish we could, but, you know, this is why my first L is for learning, you know, and this may be a little bit naive, but can we have a common baseline on what the, you know, what the, what the challenge is. Uh, does that possibly help us get to a more common understanding of what some of the solutions are? Uh, and that, you know, you could do an entire conference on whether or not that's even, even possible. But I think without a common understanding, it's, it's really, really hard. And we're, we're seeing this. We're seeing this every day I work in the park. Uh, this, this, the, the pressure is just getting turned up and turned up. And I think for preparation for fire, water stress, you know, these climate issues that we've talked about in the previous panel talked about, just simply, we are just ratcheting this pressure on our own society. And, and we're gonna need to figure out how to deal with this. Yeah, excellent. Mark or Richard, do you wanna jump in on that question? Yeah. Uh I don't want to uh, point fingers, but when we began learning about global warming and climate change, it was quickly politicized, largely because one side wanted to kill the chances of a particular candidate on the other side who was advocating uh, concern about the subject. We've got to get past that. This is real. It's got to be bipartisan and it has to be addressed politically. We need leadership, and leadership from people who had previously been neutral or negative on the subject. Uh, 
And the fact that the U.S. military has taken such a strong stand on it has me believing that indeed guys like Mark Milley, the current chief of staff, and the admirals you've had on this program and, and others will be tremendous spokesmen for to those groups still cynical about climate change. And I, uh, I'm certainly willing to stand up and speak on it at any time, at any location, because it, it is something I do fear and care about deeply. Yeah, I can, um, you know, uh, fishing is a pretty bipartisan, if there are any bipartisan activities left and topics, but fishing is probably one. And um, uh, as the water temperatures rise and as the stream flows decrease, the opportunities to fish might decrease. Um, Wyoming doesn't necessarily close fishing due to water temps, but Montana does. In July 2012, um, warm temperatures forced Montana to restrict fishing on three rivers. Um, those types of closures could become more common. Um, there could be a 30 to 60% decline in cutthroat trout populations because of warmer rivers and lower water levels. Um, so that's kind of, you know, one place where the, the rubber meets the road and, and folks uh, from all walks of life might start feeling the impacts. Um, as, as Admiral Titley pointed out, when those rivers close, all the, all the people that fish those rivers are going to crowd onto the other rivers and they will be tense and nervous and, you know, irritated by how hard it is to find a spot to fish. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, it, it, it just brings up a host of topics, but if, if that's one way to connect and say, well, this is, this is going to be the future if we don't change our ways and, and take the measures that we need to take to address climate change, um, uh, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see fewer days to ski. We're going to see worse ski conditions. Um, you know, we're talking about recreation and, and that seems kind of frou-frou when, when uh, global climate change is going to impact, um, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people in much more profound ways than, than impacting their recreational experience. But, um, you know, that's, that's a reality here. Uh, people do come here to recreate um, and, and um, business is booming right now. And one of the reasons it's booming is because we are a high, relatively high elevation Rocky Mountain Valley. And uh, for me, having grown up here, as hot as it feels and as different as it feels based on the 70s when my, my frame was set for the climate and what it should feel like, um, anybody coming here from most of the Western US is, is thinking that this is a pretty nice place to visit. <laughs> so that, that was what we predicted when we did our, our high level review of the economic impacts of climate change is that we might actually be better off in the near term, near term, whether that's 20 years or 30 years or 50 years, I don't know, simply because we're going to be one of the remaining places that people can go for a few reliable cool days and a quick dip and a clean water lake, um, and to hunt and to fish. But, um, you know, I, I would rather, trade that for a long-term scenario where we know we could still be the kind of um, place that people would be interested in coming a hundred years from now and that we would still have a reliable ski season a hundred years from, from now. So um, that, that's just uh, some of what I've been thinking about. No, uh, thank you, Mark, and, and thank you, Ambassador. I think you know your point, Ambassador Howell, about bipartisanship is, is very well taken. I appreciate you making that. And I do think, Mark, I mean, you know, you say these recreation things are frau frau, frou frou, but I don't think they are at all, actually, because I think it is when people start to experience these effects in their backyard that affect what they do in a day to day um, world is when you start to, to see more action and change. I'm, I'm from Wisconsin and hunting is a, is a key part of, of life here. And the tick population is a key part of what is people are actually feeling the effects of, of climate change in that way, in a very visceral way, and it's, it's changing the conversation, which I think can, can actually lead to action that helps everyone. 
Um, we have just three minutes left, and there is a question in the chat that I wanted to raise, and maybe we can end on, because I think it's a, a good one as we think about where we go from here. And the question is, what are ways we should adjust from trying to fight certain climate changes to accepting them and adapting? And I think this gets a bit at um, Admiral Titley's comment that we need both mitigation adi and adaptation. It's not one or the other. Uh, I often think, though, the adaptation conversation, especially right now, is perhaps lagging a little bit compared to mitigation. So how, how do we think about that, and when do we make the, the choice as to which to focus on and how? So maybe, uh, Admiral Titley, we'll start with you, and then any other kind of closing remarks from any of you, takeaways that we didn't get to that you want to make sure this audience hears on this topic? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. I, I mean, I, I would just, you know, kind of start with, again, taking this uh, climate assessment for, for this region that was, was just released yesterday and running some scenarios of how are we going to deal with water, let's say, uh, in the year 2050, in the year 2100. I mean, 2100 sounds like a long time, but honestly, if you're thinking about either dams or reservoirs or whatever, it's not. Uh, and running, you know, working, of course, with the county and, and, and state and trying to figure out some of these, uh, both the tourism as well as the permanent resident populations. And how does this work? And what's the plan? How do we get there? And there's lots of options. There's options from, do you increase water supply? Are we good as we are? Do you have to start restricting resident? I mean, residents or tourism, which are very politically contentious issues. But if you don't start looking, you know, you're going you're gonna to be up in 100% reactive mode. So you know, now is the time to start thinking about that, where you could still put people in a room and, and, and have that gathered. I'll just have one, one other thing for just a second. You know, sometimes uh, I hear, especially out here, but, but in lots of places that, you know, you climate guys, you know, you climate guys, uh, you know, we're gloom and doom, we're alarmists and, and all of this sort of thing. Uh, our projections are projections and you coming from the intelligence community certainly understand that. But by and large, if the climate uh, community has had a bias, it's been, we've been underestimating. We have either thought that things are gonna be not quite as bad or they're gonna be happening further out in the future than the reality shows. And part of the reason for that is the process. Uh, uh, the UN process is a consensus of a consensus of a consensus. And anyone who's been in a meeting or some board meeting knows, you know, you end up with mush by the time you get there. So when you read like what the UN has, understand that's like probably the best case because that's this, this really watered down consensus. So we, we should have started yesterday but if you can't start yesterday, start today and understand that the projections are, if anything, somewhat conservative. So I would use those as a baseline, not as, not as a ceiling, but rather as a floor for preparation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Richard or Mark, any last, last words for us here? I know we're already a little bit over time and they're, they're keeping us yes, they're, strict on schedule. Our, so. It will be very brief. If anyone needs a link to the uh, to the National Academy of Science uh, document that uh, Admiral Titley spoke of, I can send it to them. It's, it's on a page that I've, I've actually sent to you, Aaron. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, everyone. I'll just leave it at that. I, I really appreciate being here and, and uh, look forward to learning more and hopefully one day meeting in person. Great. Thank you so much all. I know my standard for these panels is did I learn something new? And I definitely did in this one. So it's a success in my mind. And back over to the organizers to move us along to the next session. <laughs>